Now I have the pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce the first plenary speaker of our conference. It is Professor Paul Ernest from University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Um, Paul Ernst has a Master of Science in Mathematics, but also a PhD in the Philosophy of Mathematics, but I know he will also be a, a teacher at Hampstead in, in London. Um, you have been in this field for many years. I remember when I uh, entered the field of uh, mathematics education for 20 years ago, time is wrong. <laughs> One of the first books I read was uh, a book with uh, the title The Philosophy of Mathematics Education. And it was written by Paul Ernst. It is from uh, 1991. It is a, it was, and it is, really a wonderful, a marvelous book. I, I think it could be a good idea to have a list of the classic books of, of mass education. I think we would miss it there. And uh, I would say, Paul, your book on my list, and I think on several others, would be in the top of the list, together with the book by Hans Freudens, uh, The China Lectures. I think it's two of the books that show what mass, mass education is about. I know you have uh, several interests. Uh, I read on your uh, <coughs> website that you uh, says, I have always loved exploring new ideas, and the last decade has taken me into semiotics, ethics, globalization, and other areas a little way from mathematics. I think this is really in the spirit of, of Marcus. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate that you accepted our invitation to give a lecture here at the Marcus conference. So we look forward to your lecture and all the time you call as a message to the announce. We look forward to the message you Thank you very much. Yes, it's, I, I remember hearing about this series of this, this interest group from Barrett and I thought, oh, I'm jealous. I want to be there, you know. And uh, sadly, Barrett isn't here, but uh, he's a very busy man, isn't he? But um, it's, it's a joy to be here. And, and uh, I, I was at that ICMI in, uh, here in Copenhagen in 2004 in another group, philosophy and mathematics education and stuff. But uh, I've always loved Denmark, Copenhagen, and been here lots of times. And indeed, I have Scandinavian roots, partly. My mother was from Gothenburg. And so uh, as a child, I often went to Gothenburg standard med min mormor i Sverige där. Så jag har lite jag har lite skandinavisk i min blod. But när jag när jag talar svenska, det är som en duktig pojk. It's like a good boy. Uh, I don't have the academic vocabulary, um, but I like to show off when I'm in a. <laughs> well. Um, I've always been interested in the links between mathematics and other things. Actually, I went to the University of Sussex as an undergraduate in southwest England, uh, South England, and um, th they had a policy, even in the 60s, that a maths art policy, that if you were doing, sorry, a science art policy, if you were doing sciences, you had to do one arts course, arts or humanities or something, and if you were doing arts or humanities, you had to do one science course. So they, they had that notion of interdisciplinarity, that we shouldn't be locked in these two ivory towers of the two cultures, you know, the arts and humanities and the sciences, including mathematics. But because I was doing um, mathematics, philosophy, logic, I, I didn't need to do that because I was already had a foot on each side of the divide. So th these kinds of issues, well, they've come back. Beauty is something I've become interested in, well, related it to my work, shall we say, in the last five or ten years. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a theme. But let me tell you my take on it and uh, see what you think. And of course, there's lots of things you could say, and I've chosen one path, one personal path through this subject. So I start with a question that's often fundamental to me and to us, I suppose. What is mathematics? And I'm not going to answer that very completely. No one can answer that completely, because there are so many answers. But I want to take a certain strand, uh, an unusual strand, perhaps, or tell me if it's more usual than I think it is. Um, Mathematics is a language, yes, that's not unusual, we often say that, and hence a mode of thinking. But 
with a central focus on invariance. This is my theme today, or at least it's my introductory theme, invariance. I mean, the pre-Socratic philosopher, I forget which one, said everything is change. But you could also say everything is the same. And of course, the world is the balance between change and sameness. That, that if you look at how modern TVs or videos work, pictures work, you get an image, and then the next image is a change of the previous one. They don't recreate the whole 1080 times 768 pixels. They keep the ones that are static and put the new ones on. Uh, so in other words, that they, they're keeping the invariant image and they're adding the changes on. And gradually, step by step, you get the movement that way. So in mathematics, looking at invariants, there, we, we know some immediate and obvious areas where we have invariants. We have equivalence in Euclidean geometry. And, and it was only when I did transformation geometry, I suddenly understood what equivalence was about. That it, it was really about, if you take this triangle, will it fit exactly on top of that one? Can you move it to superimpose, to be identical with that one? That was, you know, for me, the key to understanding what Euclidean geometry had been all about. Transformation geometry went straight to those moves. So it was about invariance, keeping the size, shape, structure the same. Uh, similarity in projective geometry, keeping the, si keeping the structure shape the same, but changing the dimensions. Uh, homeomorphism in topology, main, you know, keeping the holes and the connectedness, but, but um, the same, but allowing transformations, rubber sheet distortions. Isomorphism and homomorphism in algebra, deep ideas about structural similarity that, that we in mathematics have hold the, the exact keys to. These are, we talk about analogies and metaphors and things like that in a, outside of mathematics, but this, the study of these things, the precise de definition of these things we have in mathematics through isomorphism, homomorphism, deep, deep ideas. So looking more detail, I want to talk about the essential role of invariance in mathematics in, in, in three areas. First of all, and these are kind of obvious maybe, but I, I want, these are not stressed so much. New, uh, for, first of all, we have invariance of, of numerical value, that in calculations you transform terms into other terms, and, you, and what is invariant is the value. So that, and most of the history of mathematics is about calculation. Uh, I'm not talking about the fancy stuff that, you know, that all the leading abstract mathematicians do, but if you look at the footprint of mathematics and history, most of it is about calculation, teaching calculation. Calculation is, about make, is invariant transformations of numerical expressions. But, of course, uh, and, then, and then the higher stuff, we have the invariance truth value in proof. Uh, so... Um, I give simple examples here. In calculation, you have a certain term and it equals an answer. In, in uh, proof, you have certain sentences and by implication, you come to a simpler sentence, the answer. So that notion of invariance, invariance of truth in, uh, in proof, and of course, uh, terms of um, num uh, numerical value and uh, truth are interchangeable in the sense that every calculation can be expressed as a sequence of sentences and every proof can be expressed as a, a series of values. I mean, it's, you, know, you could do a technical trick to do that. So in other words, these are not as different as we're sometimes told, calculation and proof. Indeed, the first two and a half thousand years of the history of mathematics, mostly the Babylonians and Egyptians, um, was all about calculation, and because of that ineluctable invariance of value, I think that's where the Greeks got the idea of proof, where you, you have the same step by step and you're preserving something, except they were talking about transformations, of, uh, transformations that preserve truth value. And, and thirdly, this is more complex, but this will appeal to a lot of you or to recognize this. We have the, the pre preservation, the invariance of structure in modeling and problem solving. Here it's less immediately obvious because, for example, in a problem either that a mathematician faces or, or an ordinary person faces or a child or a student faces, you have often in one mode, like for example a verbal problem, and then the transformation involves representing that with some kind of model, representation, etc., and manipulating that to get an answer for certain values. 
So I want to argue that, that we have the invariance of structure in modeling and problem solving from a real world problem to a mathematical model. And that notion, that, that sort of, you know, you have a situation, you take it up to an abstract model, and then you work with that, and then you bring it back to the world with the answer, is well known as a model of, of modeling. Um, so that's a third area where we have invariance, structural invariance. So I think these are under-recognized as the, one of the key strands, one of the essential elements of the nature of mathematics. And going a bit beyond that now, in, uh, in, we, uh, math invariance is also important in science. So I've talked about in mathematics ID um, identity, equality and calculation, preserving the value of terms. And of course, we have several relationships. We have identity, but also less than, greater than, approximately equal to. Those are restricted forms of preservation and invariance. They're not, you know, you're loosening that which you require to be preserved. We have the implication, um, uh, we have equivalence and implication in proof, as I just said, preserving a truth value. Um, we have structure in problem solving and, and, um, and, and modeling, where we have iso and isomorphism and homomorphism between, informally, between the, uh, the situation and the mathematical representation, but also in physics. Uh, you know, it's not so surprising that invariance is central to physics. Newton's laws with the conservation of velocity and momentum. These are just some examples. The conservation of mass and energy, including Einstein's famous <laughs> E equals mc squared, which how you can interrelate uh, mass and energy. Again, you're talking about the conservation of something. And there are many other areas where invariance and conservation are important in physics. Um, chemistry. Um, the conservation of elements and molecules. Obviously, molecules change in some reaction. Elements are preserved uh, in, in chemistry. Molecules to some, you know, may be preserved or may change in chemical reactions. You're looking at same and different, again, invariance. Biology, the conservation of species and DNA. The, you know, that it, it's fundamentally, we have bits in our DNA that go back millions, if, I don't even know if it's billions of years, well, a long, long time anyway. And, uh, <laughs> And of course, we look at variations, but most of it is, is, is conservation. I mean, human beings haven't changed for, what, 100,000 years? That, uh, you know, fundamentally, um, Darwinian evolution no longer is going on because you don't have situations where whole subgroups die out, not in the way that, uh, that um, the survival of the fit in, in history. These are just some examples. I could talk about geology. I could talk about other areas where invariance, conservation, and, but also the little bits of change are central, central. Well, that's mathematics and science. Uh, what about the arts? And I want to claim that invariance is a very central part of the arts as well. So invariance in the form of identity or repetition is a central feature of the arts, is my claim. So I'm saying that this, the mathematics with its preservation, and preservation involves repetition, because it's the same, but of course, uh, even equivalence is the same but different. Um, uh, so identity or repetition is a central feature of the arts. Here's some examples. Uh, invariance is a key feature of music, dance, poetry, literature, visual art. I will demonstrate some of these, um, uh, by which I include drawing, painting, and sculpture. I could have included photography. Architecture, you can add other things, I think. Um, uh, you know, that's as far as I've thought. Um, even fiction, uh, the, the human character, and we talk about human identity, in good fiction, maybe any fiction, that character is preserved through, through the story, through the narrative. Now, of course, in a building's roman or in some kind of character development, or something, you have gradual changes, the organic changes that we know about and experience in human life, which is a deep issue. But you've got preservation, invariance, and change. Again, that same theme. How those changes take place, that's the source of wonderful stories, be it Goethe or Ham, uh, you know, Shakespeare's Hamlet, whoever, the identity, the changes, the shifts, the growth. Um, that, that's really the, the, hu the, the human story, but I'm stressing the preservation, the, uh, the invariance, acknowledging that there is bit by bit change. In most literature, uh, so the central character in literature, you, you have human characters which are preserved with some changes. 
um, but also the structure of literature, literary forms, the structure of narratives. Here I give one example in the picture, the hero's journey. Um, in most literature, myths, religious narratives, uh, the basic forms have similar structures. For example, the hero myth, um, after Joseph Campbell. He wrote a wonderful book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he talks about how all myths, all religions have the same hero journey pattern uh, about the, a, an individual being called to adventure, going from the known to the unknown, facing something and bringing back this special knowledge and coming back the same but different. Uh, whether it be Jesus or Mohammed or whether it be Buddha or, or whether it be the Frog King, the Fisher King, whether it be, you know, in Grimm's fairy tales. So that's, of course, not the only structure in literature, but it's a very important one. And, of course, there are whole f schools of formalism and, uh, you know, like pr prop and various others, R Roman Jakobson, and, of course, in anthropology, Levi Strauss, looking at these structures within literature and tales and the preservation the similar, you know, across these domains of literature. So I recommend The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. He's been dead 30 years, but on YouTube there are some wonderful videos of talks and programs he made, and he's such a wise and deep man. He started off as a student of James Joyce's um, Finnegan's Wake, uh, his first publication, and then went on to become professor of comparative religion. But he also himself grew into a sage, a very wise, <coughs> wonderful man. So let me move on now to music, poetry, and visual art. I've talked a little bit about invariance across in various other subjects like literature. So, for example, I happen to like this. I suppose this is a guilty pleasure. This, um, now I hope I can get this to work. Oh yeah, I use. Do you see the little dot? That's where we are. And I'm stressing the invariance. This is just the drums. But look, look at the repeated pattern. How do I turn the volume up? Or oh, can you turn the volume up? So every second to every second, it's similar, but it's also changing. Okay, it was just a, an illustration of if you're looking at music in terms of continuity and change is, is um, really interesting, I think. And likewise with Bach, just to get more serious. <laughs> oh, no, I went one too many. So Bach, there are repeated parallel lines fugue themes and things like that. Oh yeah, it's coming. You see the two parallel lines? That's harmonics. You see the visual pattern re just repeated that and again oh. so again we see the notion of um, parallel lines the same but different 
And of course, the fugue form is a formal way where you have a theme, and then you repeat the theme, and you repeat it, and then you have variation, the same but different. And to us, well, I guess the most basic human sounds are the rhythm of the drum, you know, the repeat, the repeat, and actually it has a bodily impact on us. But these are more sophisticated ways of, of uh, having that invariance, that repetition, and yet difference. So we see, um, I, I guess it probably particularly appeals to mathematicians to see this pictorial representation of the Bach music. I, for me, it was like something extra, you know what I mean? I, lo I love Bach. On an aside, sometimes they question whether that Toccata and Fugue was written by Bach. I don't know, you know, I take it as Bach. Um, but anyway, I love almost all of Bach. But the point is that visually you can see, and I chose one segment from that, where you can see these, all the, oh, oh no, um, this shape, this shape, this shape. These are all repeats. And this, this, this. You got the same, th you know, the same themes, the same structures recurring, invariance, repetition. Oh yeah, poetry. Um, Jonas Halgrimson. Do you know him? I just found this online, and it it showed the meter, and I like the meter uh, because oh no, I'm not so good with this. Um, you see, that represents a certain kind of meter. Then there it is again, and there it is again. There. So you've got a repetition of this way of declaiming coming through this. But also you've got the rhyme. You've got uh, lake with rake, if I say it right, rhyme one. You've got, is it pailu, pailu, and sailu? Whatever it is, I think they're the same because, uh, you know, and at the front you've got the scaldio and ska something. Leaked and uh, so you've got similar kinds of. I mean, if I'm mispronouncing it, at least I'm mispronouncing it twice, and so I'm, ma I'm maintaining, maintaining the uh, invariance. And there are lots of other things you could see within there, and that's part of the structure. Of you know, yes, it's free verse, but in, in verse with a set meter, with ry with rhyme and all that, you've got this preservation of structure, the same but different. If we go to uh, the visual arts. Um, I, I've had the privilege of visiting the Alhambra. They say every one of the tiling, two-dimensional tiling patterns, I think there's 17, 17 or 19, 17, uh, are, are enacted in different um, parts of the, the palace. And this is so, uh, one nice one. Um, and fundamentally, it's a triangle-based tessellation. If you, look, if you look at the shapes, you can see that equilateral triangles in there. So, but here you've got a repeated pattern and shapes and cut, uh, repeated patterns and shapes, those are part of this repetition in the tessellation. And colors, that's an additional decoration. But again, that's done in a systematic way, making up this beautiful form. Repetition. That's my theme. I keep repeating my theme. <laughs> Symmetry is a special form of repetition and one aspect of beauty in the arts. So, um, looking for rotational symmetry, there's this famous rose window of the Notre Dame de Paris, which is, this picture doesn't do it justice, but you can see it's got rotational symmetry of, I don't know what, if you ignore the, the, um, the, the, the bottom bits down here. Is that about 20 or 24? I don't know, I haven't counted. But it's got that rotational symmetry. Um, bilateral reflective symmetry, Here's a, a pattern on, on an ancient Greek vase, and the left and right are almost identical, almost. It's like the human body. The left and the right are the same but different. You know, that we're not identical. If you take one half in the mirror and you know, add the other, you look different. You know, when you look at yourself in the mirror, it looks different from if you look at yourself in two mirrors. You know, because of the... So, but we're so, we, but oh, actually, that perfect symmetry in human face we regard as a sign of beauty. If you have, you know a kind of uh, asymmetric features, that's regarded as unbeautiful, you know. Uh, I won't say ugly. So symmetry is a special form of repetition and one aspect of beauty in the arts. So symmetry is one form of structure that's significant also in mathematics. Mathematics is where we study symmetry. We study the bones of symmetry, what it means, you know, boiled down to its abstract basis. And it lends beauty. In geometry, we have transformations. We have reflection, bilateral symmetry, which is uh, more or less exhibited in this vase. We have rotation, 
with rotational symmetry more or less exhibited here. As I said, I haven't counted. Is it 24? I just can't, I can't see. I can't see it just without... It's 16. 16? But that would mean 8 from top to bottom. Yeah, but look, if it's 16, then that would be 4. But you may be right, there may be a subtle element to it that I haven't seen. That means that then you can't... But anyway, certainly I think it's a number divisible by 4. I agree with that. Translation with glide symmetry. I showed you the example from the Alhambra. And structure and symmetry are one dimension of mathematics regarded as beautiful. Maths can be decorative. In this cartoon, we did the whole room over with fractals. Oh. Uh, but I say this can be trivial. I mean, it is a bit trivial, isn't it? Although I suppose it's mathematical decoration. <laughs> Doesn't look so good in the cartoon, I have to say. And of course, the reason it's a cartoon is because it's meant to, it's absurd, right? I love cartoons. I often use them in my lectures and my work with students because somehow cartoons always look at the edge of something, you know, the, the something has taken for granted and something that challenges it. The humor is about this juxtaposition, this uh, actually the breaking of pattern, you know. Uh, the, the, so um, humor may be the opposite of what I'm. Well, I don't know. I haven't explored that line, but it's interesting to look at it in the, from the perspective of invariance. So I've mentioned the words beauty and mathematics together. Beauty and mathematics? Well, I'm going to claim mathematics is beautiful, that much of mathematics is beautiful, that we can use the word beautiful in, about mathematics, and I'm not the first to do so. Can mathematics itself be beautiful? Oh, yeah, we, we can describe the beauty of art with mathematics, so what about mathematics itself? And here's a quote from Hardy, and interesting enough, this is uh, the mathematician's apology, is one of the uh, uh, sources that's being talked about in another paper here, um, yours. Um, and he says, the mathematician's patterns, like the painters or the poets, must be beautiful. The ideas, like the colors or the words, must fit together in a harmonious way. Beauty is the first test there is no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics, which is a lovely, strong statement, isn't it? And by the way, notice the word pattern. Patterns must be beautiful. Well, he doesn't say the patterns are beautiful, but the patterns should be beautiful. And also, ugly mathematics. Well, I'll come back to that. So he says beauty is central to mathematics. He's a pure mathematician, but very strongly uh, pusher of the purest of purism, the purist ideology. If you saw that, did you see that film, The Man Who Knew Infinity, recently, with, uh, about Ramanujan and Hardy in, in uh, Cambridge, which was a very poignant film, but it was quite interesting to see, Har you know, in a mainstream Hollywood, was it Hollywood? Anyway, movie, see Hardy portrayed as an interesting but flawed character and coming across this wonderful source of mathematical intuition, Ramanujan, who, both geniuses. Beauty in mathematics. Bertrand Russell said, mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. A beauty cold and austere, like that of sculpture, without any appeal, uh, without any appeal to a part of our weaker nature. So again, there's this value judgment, isn't there? I mean, that's a side issue about the weaker nature, or ugly, or in the previous quote. And I suppose by the weaker nature, he means the passions, the passion, the, it's the mind rather than the body, I think. This is the old, and uh, so there's a trace of, even though he's an atheist, trace of religion in this mind, body, the pure spirit, the corrupted body in that. But never mind all that. This is, he certainly defines beauty in mathematics. Although there is a sense, I will echo that, because the beauty of mathematics is not something appreciated directly through our sense organs. Except when we have a look, well, in general, the deeper beauty is something, uh, as, you know, with paintings, music, or landscapes, it impacts on you directly. Uh, the beauty in mathematics involves the cognitive discernment of features such as structure. Well, maybe I shouldn't assert that as a truth, 
but put that as a conjecture that you could challenge. But in a sense, the beauty of mathematics is something more of the mind than of the body, perhaps. Although for many mathematicians, it would infuse their whole body, I suppose. Someone like Hardy or Russell, perhaps. And I think when you hear someone like Andrew Wiles and people talking about um, the moment they made their breakthrough, their, their great insight, it sounds almost orgasmic. It sounds like uh, um, enlightenment, you know, that kind of wonderful, which is fuses the mind and the body in a, in a, you know, with this wonderful awareness. Beauty is widely remarked as an attribute of mathematics and um, it is a part of mathematicians' judgments and activities in appreciating, formulating and creating mathematics. Whether you think mathematics is discovered or invented, this is true, that beauty is a part, um, part of making judgments. And Mathematical beauty can apply to almost all parts of mathematics. It's mathematical concepts, methods. Uh, you know, I think people would have talked talk, Cantor's diagonal method is beautiful. Um, uh, sentences, I'll give you an example. In e equals mc squared. All right, that's physics. But there's a beauty in the, in the sh precision and brevity of that. Uh, theorems, <laughs> proofs, theories applications, models, any of those you could apply the word beautiful to. Mathematical beauty is regarded as deep in the domain of meaning, not just about signs, although notation can be beautiful too. Well, I gave you an example from Frege's Begriffsschrift, but I'm starting to have my doubts. Maybe, maybe, you know, he, he was one of the inventors of mathematical logic and about a, you know, 1890, 18, 1879, something of that time. Um, and I'm thinking, well, maybe that isn't so beautiful. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe that's like random graffiti. But I'm sure that was what I found on the internet. Uh, but once you appreciate it, there is a beauty in it. But maybe I could have found a better example. Mathematicians have claimed there are beautiful equations such as e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. And here's a quotation from the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications. This sentence contains five of the most important numbers in mathematics. 0, 1, e, i, and pi, along with the fundamental concept of addition, multiplication, and, exponenti and exponentiation. If that's not beautiful, what is? The notion that you have all of those. But you know what they don't mention? Do you know what they don't mention is the theme of my talk. It's the equals, you know. That is actually a key fundamental element of mathematics. That notion, equals, equivalence, identity, invariance. Or that, I'm not saying that what they say is wrong, but I'm just saying it's interesting that they couldn't, you know, that a lot of people are blind to the central role of that invariance, of that equivalence, of that, that um, identity equals, etc. But it surely is a, an astonishing equation. This sentence has a deep content, a richness of ideas. It has surprise at the simple link between these things. It has brevity or shortness that you can see it all in one go. Um, connections between all these different constants. And perhaps elegance overall. So, uh, you know, there are many attributes to that which you could say are attributes of beauty. What are the criteria for beauty in mathematics? Well, um, some ideas about what makes something beautiful in mathematics are the most obvious source of beauty is pattern, structure and symmetry, as in art, and as I've shown you outside of mathematics. But the patterns must be abstract. I suppose when you look at a fractal, like uh, the uh, Mandelbrot set, you could argue that that's not... Well, it represents something abstract. It is a physical thing like a painting, but is it... The mathematics that's beautiful, or the representation, I don't know, maybe, maybe it mustn't, doesn't have to be solely abstract. Maybe you can just have patterns from mathematics that are beautiful. Is that mathematics, or is that a representation of mathematics? I, 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 you know, so maybe I, I will add a, um, a, you know, a softener to that statement that patterns must be abstract. Maybe we can have some concrete patterns that are beautiful from mathematics. Abstraction itself adds adds the beauty of mathematics, the expression of abstraction and generality are valued. 
I mean, it is an abstract language that enables us to see different things in terms of the same structures. Also, we love simplicity and the economy of expression in mathematics. We regard that as beautiful. Surprise and ingenuity in reasoning is another pleasing aspect, as in that e, e to the i pi. It's, it's, I was very surprised when I thought, that. no, come on. Interconnections between ideas and mathematics can be beautiful when you see uh, you know, this and that are linked or dimensions of the same thing. The use of mathematical modeling to capture aspects of the world can be breathtaking, demonstrating its power. A simple model, a simple equation describes all these phenomena. I remember in, when I was teaching fractals to primary student teachers, the idea that you have this very, very simple relation and then you can uh, have little variables and it grows trees on your screen, just like real trees. As long as you have little probabilistic things so the branches are not all identical, you get a little bit of... And that's beautiful. It's simple but beautiful. And that's modeling in a sense. That's showing you know, how a very simple relationship can account for the structure of trees. The rigor of reasoning and proofs. Well, Russell called it a cold and austere beauty. That precision, that ineluctable, that if you agree with step A, you end up at step Z. So formalizing these, oh, no, no, this is an illustration. So this is something I found on the web, and it looks silly at first. But look, what's this man saying looks beautiful? I think it's a man, uh, looks beautiful. Um, and he's got a tear of joy in his eye. He's seeing this equation, y half x plus 3. We can represent that as a table, and you can represent that as a graph. And it's beautiful. This, it shows how the connection between formula table and graph can be seen as beautiful. And although it looks trivial there, and although it's part of the everyday stuff we teach in secondary school, it's also Descartes' fundamental insight that changed the nature of mathematics by bringing geometry and algebra and arithmetic together. That unification is tr tremendous power. You know, we wouldn't have any of our, our visual representations or computers, uh, you know, all the ways we use uh, represent um, things on screens, all of that comes out of this con fundamental connection. So, yeah, it is beautiful. It's amazing. So, drawing on the informal dimensions of beauty, I've come up with a list of seven dimensions of mathematical beauty. I call it my seven because this is what I'm offering. It doesn't belong to me, but I take responsibility if it's inadequate because this is what I'm suggesting. So I have these seven different dimensions, succinctness, economy, simplicity, elegance. I'm putting them all together. A compression of a formula or theorem of wide generality or a proof into a few short signs is valued and admired. That, that maybe it's because of the limited capacity of our brains, but something that's, with, you know, you see it in many art forms, you know, elegance of lines, simplicity, um, it's not, to, not complexity, but when it captures something, it's beautiful. Then there's also generality, abstraction, and power. The breadth and scope of a generality or a proof evoke, evokes appreciation. We've already mentioned surprise, ingenuity, and cleverness. Unexpectedness, like wit, is appreciated when it reveals new knowledge links and connections. And I've already stressed quite a lot, pattern, structure, symmetry, visual design, um, this is another dimension. The appreciation of form and pattern in mathematics, through, although abstract, is close to the visual aesthetics of art. Logical deduction, logical reasoning, deduction, rigor, purity. The rigor and purity of logic and reasoning is uniquely valued part of mathematics. A good proof is like a perfect gold chain with unbreakable links. Applicability, modeling, and power going outside the realm of pure mathematics, because many of these dimensions of beauty really are primarily about, not exclusively about pure mathematics, but there's something when you apply mathematics, when you model, when you apply theories, they demonstrate the real world explanatory power, the, what, what uh, was called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And that is, uh, that is beautiful. You know, a simple formula describes something in the world. So that's applicability. Um, modeling power. And then finally, interconnectedness, links, unification. When you have connections, 
between different concepts and theories in mathematics. It's both it's intellectually exciting and attractive. Uh, it shows how deep the ideas are, that you set off in one direction, you set off in another direction, and then you find the same structure, you know, that the unification of theories. That is a beautiful thing. I use the word elegance under brevity. Elegance is sometimes given a dimension of as a dimension of mathematical beauty on its own. I think it's reducible to other simple, simpler descriptors than this, such as economy, maybe generality and power. And there's a book on beauty in mathematics by Montano. Elegance is sometimes defined as being the quality of being pleasingly simple yet effective. So I'm justifying why I put elegance in my first category. It's included above with economy and its synonyms as this seems to be its primary meaning. I don't mind if someone disagrees and wants that to stand on its own. So how do these criteria compare? Well, the nearest thing is uh, Hardy. Again, the, the, the book that, that we're going to hear about from Ulfra um, proposed six features of a beautiful mathematical proof. It needs to be general. The idea is used in proofs of different kinds, and this relates to the second of my things above, generality. Serious connected to other mathematical ideas. I have a little bit of difficulty with calling it serious because, you know, when you say something serious, it's like saying something's trivial or profound or serious. Can you make explicit what the criteria are for saying that something is serious? Or does that require the judgment of an elite? I'm not against uh, elites who are formed by specific knowledge and experience, but surely such criteria, such judgments, could be justified, could be made explicit. Anyway, he says serious. Connected to other mathematical ideas. I like the connected part. Um, interconnectedness, my seventh criterion. Deep. Another, this is another uh, problematic issue. But if deep, um, deep strata of mathematical ideas, if that includes connectedness and generality, I can understand it. M maybe there's something there I'm, you know, that could be added. Unexpected. The argument takes a, su a surprising form. Uh, corresponding to my su surprise, uh, dimension three, inevitability. There's no escape from the conclusion. This corresponds to five, L logicality and rigor. I mean, it's got a little bit more than that, because it's not just, um, it's a good proof somehow that you're, but a, a, any working proof should be, a, no, no, I won't go there. <clears throat> Economical, simple, there are no complications of details corresponding to one economy and simplicity. So I agree quite a lot with um, Hardy. Missing from Hardy are pattern and structure. Although pattern and structure, my, my dimension, sees the most obvious and foremost dimension of mathematical beauty, it's not as immediately applicable to uh, mathematical proofs as it is to results, theories, etc. Because the logic of proof has a structure, but that's a necessary part, so you might not see that as, as a beauty, although Ru Russell saw that as beautiful. Anyway, Hardy cites pattern in that first quote, I stressed to you, pattern, um, as part of beauty. So, you know, he may not stress it here in his six criteria, but he has stressed it elsewhere that he likes pattern. Uh, and pattern and structure, for me, are very important. And empirical applicability, I added that to, as one of my criteria, Hardy is describing the beauty of mathematical proofs, which are primarily pure mathematical productions, so applicability may not seem so relevant. But also Hardy is a purist and regards utility as ugly, so it's no wonder he left out applicability. That's the devil's criterion. And let me stress, uh, talk about the subjective aspects of mathematical beauty. Aesthetic appreciation irrational. By which I mean it can't be reduced to the, irration, to the rational. Uh, appreciation of beauty depends on human responses and feelings. We can analyze it, but you can't explain to, something, to someone why something is beautiful. You can't prove that something is beautiful. They have to feel it. So beauty, you can train someone to see more beauty, but you can't... I, I couldn't give you a theorem saying... A is beautiful, da, 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 therefore A is beautiful, and you start off thinking A is ugly, and at the end, actually, I'm thinking maybe I could, but, you know, maybe that's just dreams of um, Superman. So it's irrational. Uh, you know, it depends on human responses and feelings giving rise to preferences and actions. Of course, appreciation need not be purely subjective and idiosyncratic, for what is regarded as beautiful is shared within and possibly across cultures. 
However, there are major differences in judgments of beauty between pure mathematicians, applied statisticians, computer scientists. Within their fields, they have different criteria of beauty. And research by Inglis and Aberdeen, which was presented at one of the mathematical cultures uh, conferences, uh, found very, and if you're interested in that, look online, mathematical cultures. There's a series of um, conferences going on, relation between philosophy, mathematics, and culture. A very interesting series. I went to a few of those. Um, and he found widespread differences in the aesthetic appeal of proofs among a large sample of mathematicians, confirming there is, no, there is significant diversity in mathematicians' opinions of beauty. It cannot be denied there's a strong subjective element in mathematicians' judgments of mathematical beauty, even if there are many shared features. Well, you know what? I, uh, no, I'm going to come back to these things. Oh. Oh, no, no. I thought I had another slide. <laughs> I've just given you a quick preview, haven't I? Huh. OK. Um, well, what I thought I was looking for, I was looking for a slide where I asked the audience and um, you, do you think the seven criteria that I gave you, do you think that these are, do you, th do you think they're complete? Do you think they cover all dimensions of mathematical beauty? Can you think of something that's missing? Or, and do you think they're independent? Do you think that some of them overlap? So I want you to talk to your neighbor for two minutes about the completeness and independence of these dimensions for mathematical beauty. Yes, 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 Great. That's good? Yeah, I like it on the strap. Oh, did I put it on the strap? Great. Thank you. Okay. In 10 seconds, I'll ask you to stop. Thank you. Um, I can't get all your conclusions. There isn't time, or they'll be interesting to hear in the breaks. But does anyone have anything strong they want to say about anything missing? Because I'd be really excited to say, oh, yes, you didn't think of Because mm. I didn't think of it either. OK, so um, yes. Good, good. We were talking about that we really like, you got this, uh, that uh, beauty is not um, something general, it's subject, like, like it's something, I find something beautiful, or maybe you find something else beautiful. Okay. And we are missing the, the word, intu ish, intuition. Intuition? Yeah. Could that be somehow, it's a little bit in the surprise, mm -hmm. cleverness thing, but, but when people are playing together music, it's not always patterns, but it's also like something 
yeah. interacting yeah. together and using their... Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to relate that to beauty. I think I can't do it right now. I think that's something I need to think about. Yeah. I think that's an interesting idea. Um, and of course, that made me think, what about the interaction between people as well? Yeah. These are all very, but does that, I'm not sure if that will feature for me, but it's, it's something that isn't there. So it might be a source of more. Yeah. Intuition, yeah. intersubjectivity, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. Okay, well, I saw you were starting to fall asleep, so I always have these uh, exercises. I learned this from teaching students. You have to get them to do something. You know, that, I'm, I'm sorry it was only two minutes in an hour. <laughs> What's a genuine question, though? All right, an example. Um, you know the story about uh, uh, Gauss and how he was asked by his teacher to add one and two and three and four up to a hundred and the teacher thought well that's them busy for an hour <laughs> and then he says you know thirty seconds later I have the answer five thousand and fifty and uh, well you know when I was at school the teacher would ooh, the teacher would smack his head <laughs> but luckily we live in more civilized times now so the teacher was surprised. He, you can see it's a nice little picture of um, the pairing logic he used. And there he is, he's a young man, well, youngish, uh, because a lot of the pictures you see of him, he's quite old. You know, there's a famous portrait that you often see. But uh, the story is widely told to stress the teacher's surprise at Gauss's surprise, at his ingenuity and cleverness, dimension three, in discovering short and elegant, dimension one, brevity, solution despite his youth. And so let me use this as an example uh, in a more abstract way, that method. Uh, the following is an elementary example exhibiting mathematical beauty, I claim, drawing on the proof that the sum of 1 to n is n times n plus 1 over 2. And as is, as is well known in this proof, and the surprising step is that you say, look, I want to, oh, no, I want to um, add these up all the way to n. And so what I do is I write them all down, and then I put them in reverse, and I add them, and I add them all up, and the beauty is that the totals are the same all the way along, and that there are n of them, so I've got n times n plus 1 over 2. Fantastic. So that is a beautiful and elegant step. Of course, it's not a rigorous proof, and a rigorous proof involves uh, mathematical induction, but in, but in induction, you don't quite see how it works in the way, you know, the proof of this. Whereas here, you see that beautiful pattern of, of how the increases up and the increases down can be matched to, uh, to make a beautiful picture. And talking of a picture, um, this is a, a small relief sketch by the artist John Ernest illustrating this proof. So, and by the way, John Ernest is my father. He, he died, what, 23 uh, years ago. And uh, he was a very mathematically inspired artist. And, but I'm not just doing this to bring out my family connection, but I, you know, I genuinely, I think, illustrates this. He never exhibited this. This was a sketch which he didn't think was worthy of putting in any exhibition, but I have it on my wall in my study. And I just think it's a beautiful, simple um, uh, you know, sketch idea. So you see, these are meant to be the first three terms. These are the last three terms. And th so you've got, this is n, and then 1, n plus 1. This is, this is n minus 1 and 2. This is n minus 3. You see, sorry, n minus 2 and 3. And then dot, dot, dot. And then we've got, um, here we've got n minus 2 and 3, n minus 1 and 2, n and 1. So it's the same pattern. And uh, simplifying it, this is me just simplifying the pattern. You can see what I just showed you, how, the, how on the left and right, the, you know, you can, this is a visual representation of... Uh, and I think that makes a nice pattern too. His one has got more complexity and more elegance in, in an artistic sense. This, I think, makes a nice pattern. And I've even used that pattern on the cover of a book I did, without the numbers. 
And the beauty of that proof step in the, in the, in the diagram, we've got a beautiful symmetry between the first three and the last three turns, an order two rotation. We've got near reflective symmetry about horizontal and vertical axes, uh, but in complementary colors to, to distinguish them. That's an additional non-mathematical feature for aesthetic, artistic aesthetic reasons. And the, and the trigger brings out pleasing structural features of the proof. There's the ingenuity and cleverness of the proof, as we saw in, the, in, in Gauss's um, story. And also there's the, the beauty, not of the picture now, of the, 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 the proof, the formula, is the generality and power, because it goes for any, any uh, well, we call them sometimes in school triangle numbers. It tells you the value of a triangle number for any n, which a triangle number is made. Is that right? I think, yeah, one, two, three, four. It makes a triangle when you draw it like that. This was a simplified version. This is a further simplified. If I simplify it further, uh, taking out the gaps between the six terms, you see I've still got the one, two, three, four, five, six columns, but no spaces. Now, it doesn't work so well as, a as an illustration of a mathematical proof because, you know, the... the Cross-column features hide the, the within-column features. We can simplify even further, and this is a familiar uh, uh, diagram used in primary school to show that one, two, three, four. How we add, we can add that up uh, four, three, two, one, and you get the square. So it's using the triangle formula. Uh, that loses the generality, but it does allow generalizability. There's still a beauty in that, but it's, it's much simpler now than where we were. The dimensions of beauty shown by the proof step artwork show succinctness economy, generality abstraction, surprise, and pattern. It doesn't show logical reasoning, applicability, or interconnectedness, except only connects with the pictorial. So that illustrates some of the dimensions of beauty. I mean, there is a, this, we could debate whether I'm talking about the art object or the mathematics and how I'm confusing them. Uh, I think these properties apply to the proof as well as the art object. That's an issue. This is, this is what I was looking for earlier, the question. So the seven dimensions of beauty don't necessarily apply to all, and then I ask you if they're adequate, complete or independent, and we've discussed that. And looking some more at my father's artwork, um, he made a, a number of works based on um, group theory, you know, group tables, a, a, an order eight group. He has a multiplication table, and he do, did it visually. So in, in the center of this, there's an eight by eight square. And within each, for example, that's one element. And then he has ways of combining them to represent a, an, an order eight group. But you get these unexpected things like these diagonals and these, which gives it a kind of unexpected structure. Of course, it doesn't suddenly jump out. He chose lots of different or orders, representations, etc., to get something he thought was beautiful. He used math uh, the group theory as a starting point and then played with. So uh, that's another one of his, a Mobius strip, another group table. A cyclic group table where he plays with width of the columns to make it more beautiful. And my last slide, um, beauty in the humanities and sciences, beauty can be found of all of the arts, humanities and sciences, including mathematics. The language of mathematics provides concepts for understanding beauty everywhere. And I've stressed identity, invariance, repetition, pattern, structure and uh, structure and symmetry, but other dimensions of mathematical beauty uh, which can also be applied elsewhere. Economy, simplicity, rigor, elegance, abstraction, power, ingenuity, cleverness, linking, modeling power. However, mathematical beauty retains a unique character of its own, but it's fascinating, I think, to look at beauty and how some of the criteria stretch over the whole of human knowledge across maths, arts, sciences, as, as well as within mathematics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for starting our conference with this inspiring and beautiful journey into the landscape of mathematics, beauty, and arts. I, I think you put us right on the track. So, actually, we should have time for. Uh,
comments or questions, but we have to move to uh, building C. But I think this is a very small group, so I, I think questions and comments and all that will be part of the social activities here at the conference. So I'm sure that you uh, will get some questions and comments. So once again, Paul, thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. Thank you.